Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walchep, founder of Cali BBQ and Cali BBQ Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. I want to give a special shout out to Toast, our primary technology partner at our barbecue restaurants for being the title sponsor of this show, for believing in storytelling, for bringing so many incredible entrepreneurs in front of us, in front of our audience, um, so that we all can have a seat at the table. Today, we have a special guest, Steve Chang. He is the founder of At Copa Vida. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So grateful to have you. Uh, been doing some research on Copa Vida and really, really excited to have you on the show. This is uh, this is why we why we started this show was to share all the secrets, all the lessons, all the beautiful <laughs> lessons of the things that we do right as entrepreneurs and all the things that we do wrong. So thank you for your time. Yeah, no, my uh, former uh, mentor and uh, CEO of a previous life uh, used to tell me uh, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. And uh, I have plenty of experience <laughs> to share. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to start with our favorite random question, which is where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage or venue? Oh, Dodger Stadium by far. Um, unfortunately, even though I have a lot of locations and I'm a big fan of San Diego as well. But uh, uh, yeah, I uh, felt more I'm an immigrant. I came from uh, South Korea when I was eight years old, and uh, uh, I really felt like an American when I fell in love with baseball. And Dodger Stadium is where that happened for me. So yeah, uh, it's uh, my favorite place in the world uh, when it comes to events, spaces, or arenas, or anything like that. Well, we're going to go to Dodger Stadium, and I'm going to convince Toast. I'm going to convince Entrepreneur, and we're going to get some incredible brands out there, but we're going to fill the stadium with hospitality professionals, people yeah. that we say play the game within the game. So anybody that listens to this show, obviously you care about leveling up your hospitality and becoming a better business person, but I'm going to put you on the pitcher's mound. Yeah, there you say, go. I'm going to say, Steve, now <laughs> we have how many people in Chavez Ravine? How, how many people does Dodger Stadium fit? 52,000, 52,000, like yeah, so, 52, so yeah. we're max capacity. We're yeah, going to get yeah, 52,000 yeah. hospitality <laughs> professionals from all over the globe. And I'm going to put you on the pitcher's mound. And I'm going to say, Steve, I, I need you to share the Copa Vida story. Tell us how did, how yeah. did it all, all start? It uh, started about uh, 10 and a half years ago now. I can't believe it's been that long, but um, my family, uh, my wife's side, uh, used to uh, own a, a noodle business in Los Angeles, and I worked there for uh, 12 years. Before that, I was actually in race relations work. Right out of college uh, was uh, when LA riots broke out, and I felt uh, because I'm bilingual, I could help in that situation, trained to become a mediator, and I was doing a lot of uh, uh, race relations issues dealing with uh, uh, conflicts specifically between Blacks and Koreans in Los Angeles. And so that was uh, sort of eight to 10 years of my life. And then um, during that time, I met and uh, married my wife, uh, Elena, uh, uh, and her family had a noodle business. And uh, at some point along the way in their noodle business, they uh, my father-in-law was diagnosed with a form of cancer and asked me to come in and help while he was going through some treatment. And that in, ended up in me being kind of uh, pulled into the family business for a few years. And that those few years turned into 12. And <laughs> I uh, went from doing mediation into uh, uh, learning a lot about food manufacturing, during which time I really fell in love with the food industry. And so when we as a family exited about uh, now going on 12 almost 12 and a half years ago. Um, yeah, uh, we exited from the business, sold to a PE firm. And original plan was for me to stay on board, but without the family there, it just wasn't the same passion. So I left F to business and thought, what do I do next with my life? And there's some great advice I've received, which was one of which was uh, uh, do something you love and it won't feel like work. And I really liked that idea. So um, I decided to take some time to figure out what I, I'm passionate about. And two of the things that come up after faith and family is baseball and coffee. And it was a little bit too late to be shortstop for the Dodgers. And it was, you know, <laughs> taken by somebody else. Uh, uh, but I thought, you know, coffee, I, I, I have a chance in coffee. And so I took a year off and just studied coffee. And we went everywhere. Uh, we spent uh, uh, five weeks in Europe traveling from major 
uh, um, cities that had coffee culture. That was really a big part of its culture. So Barcelona, Rome, uh, Paris, uh, spent some time there, uh, spent time in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, any place that had a coffee culture that was broader than just uh, simply, I need a cup of coffee at the local Dunkin' Donuts. It was you know, developed into and baked into how people enjoy their day and spent their time. So I wanted to go see how you know, all of that kind of worked out. And then I spent a, a month and a, a few weeks in, in Costa Rica. And that's where I really learned coffee, learned how to pick the cherries off the, the vine to processing it, to roasting it. Uh, to to uh, uh, making latte art and uh, spent uh, a lot of time doing that. And when I was sort of finished with my learning, came back and created Copa Vida uh, and opened our first location in 2013 in uh, Pasadena, Old Town. And then uh, since then, it just kind of blew up and uh, um, we ended up growing a lot, really strong in, in San Diego, have a great following there and just love the community in San Diego. So we have more locations in San Diego than Los Angeles, though I started out in Los Angeles. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, that's been uh, now nine and a half years of doing that. Yeah, it's been crazy. That's incredible. So you, I, I love what you said about finding something that you love. Uh, my One of my mentors recently told me a quote that um, if, if you learn, if you learn to love what you do, it will share all its secrets. Mm -hmm. You know, you just described my father-in-law in a nutshell. He loved making noodles and over 30 plus years, he kept on finding new secrets as he uh, worked at it and worked at it and worked at it. But it was definitely a passion uh, and a love for him to the point where the children would say that uh, the business was his first child and <laughs> and true, his favorite child. <laughs> now, when you look back on the travels before you launched uh, Copa Vida, you talk about coffee culture. Where were the secrets presenting themselves strongest? Mm, yeah, I think the first secret I learned was there is no such thing as the best coffee in the world. <laughs> there is no such thing as the greatest coffee. Everywhere I went, people had a different understanding of what that was. And so if you chase the best coffee to make the best coffee, it's actually chasing something that doesn't exist. Yeah. A way someone enjoys coffee. And I've had coffee all over the world, Asia, Middle East, Europe, Africa, you know, it just I've had coffee in all parts of the world and everybody drinks it differently and everybody enjoys it differently. Even the same words like a cappuccino here versus a cappuccino in Australia versus a cappuccino in and in, in, in Rome, they all have a different definition and a meaning. So one of the secrets I learned ahead of time early on is uh, through the travels is the idea of trying to make the best coffee in the world is senseless. So let's not pursue that. You know, uh, that was the first thing I think that uh, uh, kind of like opened its door to me. The second thing uh, about coffee community, especially that I thought was amazing uh, that I learned was um, it's in development, meaning we don't have it figured out. We're still figuring out, even with the many years that there's science behind this now, and there's a lot more maturity in the industry than even when I started, there's still a lot of things being formulated and figured out on the fly. So, and, and what people like, what they enjoy keeps changing and technology keeps changing. So there is no such thing as being done or arriving or getting there, if that makes any sense, yeah. I love the way that you talk about it. It reminds me of the craft of barbecue when we decided to to go into the art of barbecue. So many people were like, oh, you want to be the best barbecue? Absolutely not. There is yeah. no best barbecue, especially yeah. trying to do barbecue on the West Coast in San Diego when you yeah. have so many people that are transplanted from all the barbecue meccas of the United States. Yeah. Uh, when you think of the craft of coffee and the culture of coffee, what did you want to instill in that first shop that you opened up in Pasadena? Yeah, um, I think uh, the aha moment was down in Costa Rica for me. It was the last day of uh, training and uh, it was latte art time. So I had the whole day just working on latte art with a 23 year old woman named Melina who had been a barista since she was 13. And she's showing me how to make latte art and I can't make it. Everything I, you know, pour, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm a relatively smart guy and I'm kind of, you know, not, you know, silly with things like this. I'm coordinated and I can't for the life of me figure out how to make this milk float and take shape. So every time I made it, it's just a circle or a butt or an apple or a peach. 
but it can't make a heart. And it was getting really frustrating for me. So I remember saying to her, hey, um, why is yours so pretty and mine so ugly? And it was just a throwaway statement. And she said uh, back in reply, it's because you don't love coffee yet. And it shook me to my core because I was like, I just spent thousands of dollars and spent a year studying coffee. And I've been drinking coffee since I was in high school. And you're telling me I don't love coffee? And I got kind of upset. Um, and she said, hey, don't take it the wrong way. I'm telling you my uncle, all my uncles are farmers, coffee farmers. My father's a coffee farmer. My grandfather's a coffee farmer. My brother is a coffee farmer. When I say I love coffee, it's in my blood since I was born. And so it's different than you loving coffee. And she was right, right? So I got on the plane, I'm flying back and I'm going, you know, um, if I don't love coffee like her, how do I do this business? How do I jump in and say, hey, I'm making product that's worth this much money, you should come and buy from me when I don't have that depth of knowledge and experience, because she's got, you know, 23 years of it, and I just, I just started, right? And it was really bothering me, and, and then it hit me that, you know, in, before I get mad about it or get frustrated by it, how do I lean into that and embrace that? And so the idea was, well, if that is true, then what I need is people who do love coffee and have that kind of experience in the business with me, in partnership with me, and I got to bring them into leadership with me. But what is it that I bring to the table, right? And so I started thinking about that and I realized what I'm really good at is building community. That's what that first part of my life and my first career was all about was helping to build community. And even the noodle business, the reason my father-in-law started that business is because he loves the idea of people gathering, families gathering around a bowl of noodles. Because in China where he's from, uh, noodles were only served during, you know, celebrations. That's when something happy happens, it's when the noodles are made and everybody kind of, you know, gets excited about it. So it's one of those things where like, I understand that. I understand design, my background's in urban planning. So I'm, I'm kind of going, that's what I want to bring to the table. So when we started building Copa Vida together, uh, I, I brought in other people to help me. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to emphasize was, yes, we're coffee craft experts, but the way our customers experience isn't just through the craft, it's actually through hospitality. So how do we create a space where people feel welcome when they come? And that is both through product, but it's also through service, and it's also through design. You have to be purposeful. How does the line layout? Where are the seats? Where are the tables? Uh, what sizes are they? You know, is it good for large people, skinny people? Do you have something for everybody? Tall, short, people in wheelchairs? What do you have that allows anybody that walks in to feel comfortable? So, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I'm an immigrant, and I used to be able to walk into a restaurant and kind of tell pretty quickly whether I was welcome there or not, Yeah. right? And, and I used to think that was something that immigrants felt. And then I realized as when I was in race relations where everybody feels this way for one reason or another, socioeconomically speaking, you know, we've all been there, we walk in and we're like, I don't know if I have enough money to be here. And they look at you and say, I don't know if you have enough money to be here, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and, and you know, you feel that across gender, everything. So everybody has had that experience. So. For us, what we wanted to really build into from day one to our location was this idea that no matter who you are, when you walk in, you feel welcomed. And after that, we have to build work together to make that work for everybody. So our coffee shop isn't gonna be something that fits everybody, that's impossible. But we wanna make sure you feel welcome the day you come in and then you can decide whether this is your place or not your place. But we wanna give you the power to do that and not be at a place where we're already rejecting you before you come through the door. Huge news, Toast, our primary technology partner at our barbecue restaurants in San Diego and the primary technology partner of so many of the guests that we have on this show have announced they are expanding their business offerings with Google. So now if you search on Google Maps and you sign up for Toast Tables or Toast Waitlist, you will have the opportunity to improve the digital hospitality experience of the guest, allow them to book through the maps into the Toast Reservation system. One of the biggest difficulties that restaurant guests have is when they search for your restaurant and they want a table, 
they do not have an easy solution to book a table or to get on a wait list. This is huge news for the restaurant industry, huge news for guests and huge news for you, the restaurant owner. Check out Toast Tables today and find out the new integrated solution that they have. This is something that we've wanted for a long time. How do you integrate reservations, wait lists into your point of sale? Toast has done it. Check it out powerful when you talk about your experience with race relations in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and being a mediator as somebody that's confronting two different sides and typically mm -hmm. polar opposite sides to come to some sort of understanding and to create back to what you said one thing that you are good at is building community how do you build community when you have two sides that are so different yeah I think to be clear I want to make sure I don't believe that a coffee shop builds community. I think a coffee shop is a place where community is built. People it. have to build their community, right? It. It's, yep. you know, you can only set the table, but they have to decide what to do with that, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, our job as hospitality people isn't to convince to get along with everybody. That's impossible. But if your food introduces your culture to somebody who has never experienced it, and it's the best introduction of that culture, then that's great. You would actually help build a bridge. And one of the things that I really learned during this time is that if you look for right and wrong, you never get to a solution of inclusion, right? If you have to find and define things as this is the best way to do something or this is the worst way to do something, you really run into trouble because that polarizes and causes people to decide whether they're for it or against it. So our job is to actually help provide a place and product where people can easily link up over that is kind of neutral to a degree, right? So how does that work in a coffee shop? Well, yeah, space, design, and, you know, light really actually matters. So, you know, we actually try to build in a corner of the coffee shop that's always darker than the rest so that someone who wants to feel more intimate or be in a quiet place can find that. And we always, always have a place where there's a larger communal table and uh, uh, something that more people and strangers can actually sit around. And I think coffee shops are really well built for that, where, you know, you go to a bar and you say hi to a stranger, there's usually a question of what's your actual reason for saying hi to me? <laughs> you know, it, it could be for a lot of different reasons. But yeah, uh, at a coffee shop, there's a lot more safety, I think, than uh, uh, and a lowered set of um, social expectations uh, or, or trappings, if that makes sense. And so um, that's what we're doing. We're, we're you know, and, and that's, this is where mediation really helped me out because in mediation, it's all about finding a neutral space, yeah, a, a safe space for people to be able to meet. So you don't do it in their community or in their community, you find a third place, right? And so uh, a coffee shop, I think, is, is really ideal for something like that. What can a coffee brand learn from Howard Schultz and Starbucks? Oh my gosh, oh, so much. Um, I think the first thing that we all have to accept and learn is that in order to have impact in any business, size matters, right? I, I could have the best farm to cup story and I could be transparent and want to pay the farmers the best money I can. But if I'm only buying six bags or 10 bags a year, I'm really not that helpful, right? These farmers need to sell a lot more than that in order for them to, to, to make their lives work. So size really matters. So one location is great. So I'm not demeaning anybody and, or anybody's business size, but one of the things that you're asking what we can learn from Starbucks is that they move the industry one way or another because of their size and their significance. They decide something, you know, to do something. If they make traceability important, it becomes important for, for everybody else. If they make price sensitivity important, it becomes important for everybody else. So that's one of the things I think I learned uh, uh, from Howard sort of journey. The other thing I think uh, his journey is uh, uh, kind of uh, interesting is that he actually did start kind of humble, two, three locations. It wasn't like he started with a massive amount of VC funding and just dumped all this into, you know, he grew into that right from a uh, uh, few locations in Seattle to all of a sudden, the, you know, one of the best known brands worldwide. And, um, you know, there's something to be applauded for that and, and something to be learned from that journey of what courage it takes to go from that to that. And then, um, you know, these days I feel like he spends a lot of time working to try to define what culture in Starbucks means. 
And I, I'm not sh saying he succeeded or he's failing. I don't know. But man, what a daunting task when yeah. you have that size of a company. Yeah. I'm, you know, uh, already frustrated at my own inabilities to handle 89 <laughs> employees and, and, you know, trying to define culture for our company with just that size. It's already yeah. feeling very um, overwhelming for me. Uh, but uh, to know that he's trying to do that with thousands and thousands of people is just incredible. Yeah. So uh, my grandfather, he taught me to stay curious, to get involved and to ask for help. One of the hardest yeah. lessons for me to learn was to ask for help. Are you good at asking for help? Um, I would say I give myself sort of a B. A B? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. B minus maybe. B minus. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm very good at asking for help in areas I don't know. Yeah. And that's not hard for me to say. But in areas that I think I know, I don't ask for help. But then you realize after a while, oh, you didn't know it as well as you thought you did, you know? Yeah. yeah, you could have asked for more help on that, uh, and you probably would have gotten better input. And especially from, I think, uh, folks that work for you and not just uh, uh, others who you would go out to. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of that, but it's a really uh, 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 sort of fine line to kind of stay on, right? Because um, you have people looking to you to make decisions, to trust your instinct, your judgment, your experience. So if you constantly have to ask people for help with that, you feel like, at least personally, I do feel like, you know, you lose some of that uh, uh, credibility as a leader. Uh, but then if you don't ask for help, you know, you're not going to get it done either. So yeah. it's this sort of fine line of maintaining leadership at the same time, uh, being flexible enough. I think where I have the hardest time asking for help is whenever that uh, input impacts our brand. Because I do want to hold on to that jealously. And I think it's okay that as a founder or an entrepreneur or as an owner, that you want that to be uh, uh, held in sort of tight uh, uh, core, because yeah. that's the reason you got to where you got to. So why would you all of a sudden go, okay, now somebody can come in and change my <laughs> brand because I don't know where right. to take it next yet, right? So yeah, uh, yeah that's where I kind of, yeah. When you look at the business that you're in, the coffee business, and you think about all the things that you can do to add additional revenue streams, where do you draw the line where you say, we're selling tea, we're selling food, we're a restaurant, mm -hmm. we're a retail company? Where, where do you draw the line? Yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. <laughs> um, I, I don't have an answer because uh, <laughs> I've, I've stretched into so many things, but Copa Vita started with the intention of uh, our tagline is actually coffee, tea, food and life. Right. So we started with the food program. That was one of the things that made us niche. Our, our sort of entry into the L.A. coffee scene wasn't, oh, my gosh, they have this amazing coffee program. It was more, hey, they have this great coffee program and they serve great food, too. And that was kind of unique. There wasn't a lot of places that was that were, you know, the, that was able to do both. It was either a great coffee shop with some marginal food or a great restaurant with some decent coffee. But we tried to find that line in between. And um, tea was another segment of ours that was very important to me, especially coming from an Asian background. Mm -hmm. uh, tea has a special place in my heart, too. So it's one of those things that we spent a lot of time developing. But because we already started with sort of three core uh, 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 areas of, uh, of service and, and, and product, um, when I started adding more to that, uh, it really put my team on its heels, right? So merchandise and, okay, that's too much. Uh, ready to eat. And, oh, yeah, no, not too much. Catering, oh my gosh, that's a whole nother <laughs> beast. And you need another person. Okay, let's pull that back. Subscription. And, you know, uh, of course, COVID changed all of that. And yeah. we realized some of the decisions we made early on was very helpful for that. And then some of the decisions we made real early on was really hurtful to that. So we saw both sides of that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, a anything that takes you away from your core too far, uh, I think would be my uh, uh, answer to that. And regardless of what you add on, it should never ever take the place of the core unless you intentionally shift your core. Yeah. Do you have a story of any of the locations where you opened and you 
either regret opening or you wish you had done something a little bit differently? Oh yeah. Um, we had one location. Uh, it's already closed. And so I won't uh, <laughs> talk about it, but the partnership I had with the, 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 the developer was really great, which is the reason why I took that location. But the person who was in charge of that relationship with us, the person who was in charge of that building, uh, developing it, retired halfway through the build out. Okay. And then some new folks came in, they, and we did not have the same sort of, they saw us more of a, as a headache or an afterthought as to part of this large building, uh, rather than a, a sort of a support or an amenity to the building. Yep. And so because of that relationship changed from day one, it was a real hard, uh, thing to uh, uh, make succeed. So, you know, uh, we, we didn't get the full place built out to the original design. They started cutting corners right away. And so the result of it is we got maybe 60% of what we were aiming for out of that relationship. Um, and then uh, just, it was one of those bad luck places. Uh, we had somebody yeah. who jumped off the building and committed suicide oh. and, and, and you know, not from our team, but somebody yeah. in the building with another tenant. Mm -hmm. and, and that happened right in front of our coffee shop. I mean, oh. stuff like that just made me go, okay, I don't want to be here. Yeah. Uh, this is, this has just got that kind of, you know, uh, uh, not a natural fit. And that was always hard because yeah, the tenants, the, the landlord, um, uh, and our own team, nobody felt comfortable being there. Yeah. When you look at recruiting leadership, um, into your organization, what are the key attributes that you, you, you're seeking? Character. Um, especially on the leadership level uh everything else can be taught everything else can be worked out but character is really hard to uh change in somebody uh, what i'm looking for is someone who is professional but someone who understands how to take care of both ends at the same time and that's a weird way to put it but i think specifically general managers uh have the roughest job in our in our, our company uh, if you're in the uh, upper management team with, you know, heading up a marketing or heading up HR or accounting, it's your role is very clear what it is you're supposed to do and who yeah. you answer to and who you serve. If you're on the shift and you're on the bar and you're in the kitchen, your role is very clear too. There's customers to be taken care of. That's who you, you know, focus on. And that's who you please more than anybody else. But as a GM, you're kind of stuck in the middle and you're serving three groups at the same time. You're serving the customers, but you're also serving your staff. And then you have to serve your upper management team or your ownership, right? So you're always in that middle place and you get uh, pressure from all sides and you're constantly, I think, uh, uh, having to play a bridge builder. So if you don't have the right character and right integrity, that causes you to fold or cut corners or do things that uh, probably in the short term solutions, but long term failures. And uh, uh, that's really hard to find someone who's going to be good at that. Right? Yeah. If you're speaking to the entrepreneurs that are listening that want to launch their concept, whether it's a coffee shop, a bagel place, mm -hmm. a pizza restaurant, um, mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give them? Um, I found this to be helpful for myself because it's one of those things where I failed at. And so I learned how really important it was. Know your marketplace before you know your product and your service. If you get stuck on your product, then you better go find a marketplace where that product sings and there's not, it's not gonna work everywhere. But if you don't understand your marketplace, who you're going to sell first, and then you design your product beforehand, uh, it's really kind of hard, right? So one of the things that, you know, uh, as a as sort of a, a you know a side project or a, a thing that kind of drives me on the side is this idea that I wanted to help. Uh, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I actually wanted to help missionaries be able to open up coffee shops, uh, and that I would help support doing that. Yeah. Um, and you know, three years in, I was excited because I was going to be able to help somebody do that, and realize in the middle of that conversation that I sell coffee at four dollars and fifty cents a cup on average, four to six bucks. He's going to a third world country where the average household income is $250 a month. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's not going to work. My model doesn't work over there. So the marketplace and the product has to match. But a lot of times I talk to entrepreneurs who are so excited about the product and service, 
you know, and that's what they focus on. Oh, I make beautiful coffee or I make amazing ribs or I make, you know, whatever it is that you're excited about. That's fine. There's no problem with that. But then don't go take that product and open it in a place where the market's going to be like, why are you here? You know, that doesn't work for us, right? So I think that disconnect, so so much, so many of us, including myself, jump in. I mean, you've heard my story. I said, what do I love? I love coffee. So I started with coffee product in mind. But um, I think you have to understand your marketplace first and foremost. Yeah. Go enjoy experience. Yeah. What does that mean? Oh, uh, that's been our tagline since we uh, opened and it's had several different uh, iteration. But um it means different things for different parts of our business. So for example, in our roasting, uh, we uh, became, we, I bought a small roasting company, a micro roaster out of Long Beach called True Beans about six months into the business. And for me, what I wanted to do was vertically integrate. So have the retail, yep. you know, add a roaster, and then one day become importing uh, importer when we're big enough in size. Uh, but when we started uh, the roasting company, I realized I knew very little about roasting. So instead of launching the roasting company immediately, we took a year, our team took a year to learn what we mean by what we want to do. So for a year and a half, we bought other people's coffee and served it. And we were just trying to figure out how we want to roast. And when we started doing that, I got really frustrated because um, there were so many people who were throwing out certain words that weren't meaning the same thing to each other. So we would say words like specialty coffee or, or third wave coffee yes. or dark roast, light roast, without actually having a clear understanding of what those terms meant. Yes. And it got very frustrating because the co committee I created, one was a superstar barista, another one was a superstar roaster, and the other one was me, which is, you know, I call myself a superstar taster because I love enjoying <laughs> things more than I like making things in many ways. Yes. So the three of us would argue about what we wanted to do with coffee. And in that argument, I realized we weren't even using the same terminology in the same way. So we had a swear jar. So if we use words like specialty, you know, say that's I not specialty, it. we I had to put it. money in there because that's great. it was like, we got to get ourselves off of that. So how do we create language where we're going to understand each other? And that's where Go Enjoy Experience came in. So Go Coffees are coffees that we roast that are you know, super nutty, chocolatey, sweet, and it's meant to go really well with milk. That's what we're looking for, kinds of coffees that fit in there. And then enjoy coffees are coffees that are a little bit more acidic. So it has floral notes, it has fruit notes. It's one of those, oh man, I never knew coffee could taste like this. And you should be able to enjoy it black without having to add anything to try to uh, hide or enhance flavors. And then experienced coffees are coffees that have a story behind it or our award-winning coffees. And so it means something deeper than just something you're drinking as a beverage. You have to experience the full thing. Uh, for example, we had a coffee for a while where every bag we sold, money from that bag, the farmer, he would take his cut and put it towards a, 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 a college fund for one of the, the, the kids of the people who worked uh, on his farm. Wow. I mean, like, how meaningful is that, right? I don't yeah. know. You know, I know one of them already went to college, but, you know, I don't know how much they ended up gathering because they weren't just doing this with us. They were doing this with everybody. But I love that coffee, yeah. right? And it wasn't the best scoring coffee, I would say. But, man, I, I'll pay extra for that. You know, I'll pay 50 cents extra for that, right? Um, if uh, another experienced coffee we had is this coffee farm in Rwanda that was started by, uh, it's a women only co-op, it's women owned co-op. And the reason they started this uh, uh, wasn't because they were anti-men, it was that they just went through a genocide and all of them lost their husbands. Wow. And so they were in a place where they didn't have the typical breadwinner in their culture. So they had to go out of their norm to you know, do things that their typically husbands would do. And they made themselves, be, taught themselves how to become farmers. And so this coffee is so meaningful in that sense because it has this depth of story behind it and a purpose behind it, right? So that's how we categorize our coffees is go enjoy experience. Um, Love it. Yeah, but we do that with service and with other things as well. Yeah. So when you look at hospitality digitally and you look at technology that it takes to serve coffee at its highest level, what makes you want to switch over to a company like Toast? Oh, good question. So for me, it isn't so much, uh, oh, I like Toast so much better than Square or any other POS. That's not how it started for me. 
uh, it was that as we got to our fifth, sixth, seventh location, we're now at nine, or we just opened our 10th, and we have another one coming uh, next summer. Uh, I'm sorry, at the end of summer. And um, we uh, realized that at a certain size, some of the things that we had with our previous POS wasn't giving us enough information. You know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that I should be uh, doing FaceTime at every location I go to or that we have. But once we got past five, it was really hard to even visit everyone every week, right? Because, you know, you go into one location a week and you're still, you know, week and a half, two weeks yep. before you're, you're at every uh, spot. So you start to miss a lot of things. Uh, and I'm a huge believer in management by walking around, right? You got to go see it. You got to go smell it. You got to go touch it. You got to feel it if you're going to know what's happening. But as that becomes less and less feasible, you have to depend on uh, data, data that's driven to you, data that's made easy to access, but also to understand data that shows you, you know, true picture. And I don't believe, you know, a, a qualitative analysis is the only way to look at your business or that you should. I mean, well, quantitative, I'm sorry. Uh, you, sh you need both. You need qualitative, quantitative, right? You need people's color into what's happening, but the numbers speak for themselves as well. And that's why Toasts became uh, something we decided to dive into. And so we're going through a transition process. It's going to take some time for us to do that. But as we open new locations, we're transitioning into Toast so that we can um, uh, start building that into all of our locations. But my dream one day is to have a dashboard, which one of the things that Toast uh, does provide that shows you know the performance of all, all of our locations in, in a very digestible way. Yeah. Well, I know they're they're working on some stuff that I, I can't say, but uh, they're, they're definitely working on some things yeah. um, to make to make life easy on the multi multi unit brands. Yeah. Um, so every single week on Wednesday and on Friday on the social audio app Clubhouse, we invite digital hospitality leaders, people that listen to this show. So no matter where you are on earth, we want to hear about your restaurant. We want to hear about what you're building, whatever, uh, whatever drives you. If you're in sales, if you're in marketing, if you're a content creator, if you're in hospitality, please join us on the social audio app. Clubhouse every Wednesday, every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we also give shout outs for people that support this show. Uh, this week's shout outs going to Eric Gustafson. Uh, he is the toast rep um, that called my attention to uh, Steve Chang and the incredible Copa Vita story. I am so grateful um, to have your wisdom on the show to, to share with our, our listeners and our audience. Uh, now I'm going to ask you a difficult question. I know you have an entire team behind you, but I need you to give me a shout out of one person on your team that has gone above and beyond. This is going on entrepreneur.com. So uh, they get yeah. their, their time to shine. I need one person. Yeah, no, I mean, you're going to get me in trouble because I have so many <laughs> great people on my team and I depend on them. But uh, right now, the person who's probably feeling the most pressure of all the switches and changes and, and, and build up is a woman named Brandy Erickson, and she's our regional manager. And she's been running back and forth from San Diego to L.A. every week and managing both uh, uh, our new location and development as well as getting our team in order as we grow and scale. And she's only, you know, she's been with us less than a year and she already feels like this person who we couldn't live without. And so I just want to yeah, shout out to her and thank her. And she's doing an amazing job. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, congratulations to her. Now I'm going to ask you real quickly about your, uh, your smartphone usage. So we, we believe in smartphone storytelling. We believe there's never been a greater time for business leaders on earth to connect with people all over the globe, telling stories on the internet. Um, do you prefer working on your desktop or on your smartphone? Oh, uh, you know, I'm going to sound like a boomer, but a desktop is something that I prefer more. But in reality, I use my smartphone more than my desktop. Okay. Desktop or laptop? Laptop. Sorry. Laptop. Okay. Um, iPhone or Android? iPhone. And what version? Uh, I have, you know, I have no idea. I, <laughs> <laughs> I have, uh, I think. Uh, you don't get 11, the latest. You don't always upgrade, I guess, is the question. No, no. I feel like uh, the turnover time. I, like, I, I really quick. want an ROI. I hate <laughs> waste. And every time I feel like I take a perfectly fine phone and upgrade it to 
the next phone, I feel like I haven't gotten my return on investment yet on the original phone. I and this it. is where my you know daughter goes, okay, boomer, but you know. Okay, okay boomer. <laughs> um, email or text? Uh, email still. Uh, phone call or text? Uh, phone call. Phone call. Um, do you listen to music on your phone? I do. Spotify or Apple music? Apple. Apple. Uh, what's your favorite app? I don't think I have a favorite. The one I most, use. Most used app. Most used. It's a tie between an app called Life360, okay. uh, where it shows where the location of every one of my family members are. And you know, <laughs> I have a daughter in college and daughter in high school. And, I love you it. Know, yeah, and I'm always caught up at work and driving back and forth from San Diego. So it helps me kind of feel a little more secure about my family knowing where they are exactly. Uh, and then uh, as uh, uh, far as the other part is, uh, I'm probably on my Square app quite a bit because that's where my, yeah, currently, and uh, that's soon to be Toast app, I'm sure. But I'm sure. Yeah, on my, uh, 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 yeah, because I which, don't want to see my numbers. Uh, which app do you, do you dislike the most? Notifications from which app that you use? Oh, um, I would say uh, right now, and it's got nothing to do with the uh, um, the app itself. But uh, I was on uh, uh, when I travel. I was I'm on WhatsApp a lot, mm -hmm. and then somehow people got my number, and I get you know crazy posts from people I've never met, and you know like yeah. So yeah, I've turned that off, and you know. <laughs> so do yeah. you, and do you prefer photos or videos? Uh, photos still. Photos still. Okay. Beautiful. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for uh, all of your leadership, all of your wisdom. We're grateful uh, to have you on the show. Uh, it's at Copa underscore Vita. You can follow them on Instagram. Uh, where, where can they follow you? Uh, where, where should they go? Oh, yeah. Our website and our Instagram our pages are where uh, people find most information about us. Uh, uh, Copa-Vita.com. Uh, is our website and yeah uh, you've already are there, mentioned there are there any new any new markets that we should be aware of yes we're moving into orange county so oh, we will be there we opening go. in yeah uh, irvine uh next month in may uh and so i'm really excited about that that'll be our first location in orange county because now i'll have a place to stop on my way down to san diego and back yeah there you go i love it well, uh, if you guys want to reach out to me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. I am weirdly available on all the social platforms. We appreciate you for listening to the show. Please subscribe. Please share it with a friend. And uh, please go enjoy some Copa Vida if you're in the Southern California area. Thank you so much, Steve. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Sean. It was fun. Thank you for listening to Restaurant Influencers. The best way that you can help us with the show is to subscribe and write a review. We love the opportunity to connect with you no matter where you are on the globe, no matter what restaurant you are running. Please send us a DM on social at Sean P. Walchef. If you are interested in toast, if you want to improve your digital hospitality, please send me a DM. I will get you in touch with a local toast representative. We appreciate you listening to this show. The best way that you can help the show is share it with a friend and we will catch you all next week or we will see you on one of the digital playgrounds that we call social media.